everybody is able to join us today. Just want to go over a few logistics real quick before I hand this over to April and Dr. Roberts. Um, just a reminder to members, all members who are part of this council need to make sure your video is on and make sure that before you speak, you can take off mute and um, that way you'll be able to speak. In just a moment, April is going to do roll call. She's going to call each member, so each member will make sure their video is on and then they'll either say here or present to make sure we have our roll call. And then she's also going to ask for approval of our meeting minutes. And I'll just review the agenda real quick. After that, um, our commissioner, Kevin Brown, will, will give us a little introduction for our meeting to set the stage. Lynette Baldwin will provide a cage update. Whitney Hamilton will give us some information about summer learning. Krista Hall and Misty Higgins will talk about our reentry guidance and uh, teaching and learning and some things they have planned. I know we will, we will have a lot of discussion and questions about um, what we're considering for reentry to school in the fall. I know that'll be a, a major part of our agenda. And then April and Dr. Roberts will provide an update on gifted and talented and have a discussion about issues that are pertinent to you all. And then we'll have Kevin close us out. So um, we also want to make sure that we recognize Dr. Thompson. He will be um, retiring and um, will be rolling off the council. And we want to make sure that we um, say thank you, Dr. Thompson, for your, your service to the Kentucky and on the council. So well, thank um, you for that acknowledgement. Yes. Yeah, so would you like to say anything there? We really appreciate your your service. It's a good trip uh, as far as meetings in various ways and not in various ways. But uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to not just provide some input and service, but uh, also to uh, you know, have some input and say into what goes on in the world of gifted ed here in Kentucky. And also to work with all the uh, various or on the committee now that have been on started. And uh, it's been a real good experience. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you for that. We appreciate your uh, support and collaboration. And so I um, want to turn it over now to April Peeper, and um, she will get us going. Thank you, April. Not a problem. I'm going to do roll call. When I call your name, and these are in no particular order, um, they're not alphabetical or anything. Um, but when I call your name, um, if you will just signify that you're here or that you're present, that would be great. And this is for the official recording for the um, for the attendees. Carla Pleasant. Here. Joe Percival. I'm here. Taylor Thompson. I'm here. Absolutely. Lindsey Burton. I'm here. All righty. Deanna Miller. Emily Lawson. Dr. Julia Roberts. Here. Catherine Booth. Brandy Daniels. Lisa Sisk. I'm here. Diane Mackey. Who has just emailed me. She can't get in. All right, I will work to help Miss Mackey get in when I'm finished here. I am here, obviously. Um, Lynette, Bur L Lynette Baldwin. Lynette is not on. Okay. All right. So that is the official roll call. I will help Miss Mackey get in. Oh, maybe that's her. That is her. Okay. Good. One second. Let's get her in. Yeah, she should just admitted her. She should be ready. Thank you. Miss Mackey, are you in? She's in the meeting. She just needs the Miss Mackey needs to take um, her microphone off mute. Okay.
Miss Mackey, if you could unmute your microphone and let us know that you can hear us. She may have some audio issues, April, so we, okay. we can continue we'll, to. We know she's in the meeting, but we're gonna, we'll, we will continue and move ahead. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not sure that we have exactly a quorum um, with Miss Mackey. We will, but uh, Joe, do I count her at this moment or no? Yeah, she's in the meeting. We just okay. need to help right. her with so the audio. A, gotcha. All right, so um, Dr. Roberts, we do have a quorum. Wonderful. Um, how nice it is to see each of you. I would love for it to be in person, but that isn't what's happening these days. And as we start out, I'd like to read the purpose of the advisory council, so that which is printed at the top of our agenda. The gifted and talented education advisory council is hereby created for the purpose of advising both the Department of Education and Board of Education on issues relating to the provision of educational services for gifted and talented students in the Commonwealth. So that stays front and center in, in what we're thinking about and issues that we're talking about today. Next thing on the agenda is to review the minutes, and I hope you've taken the time to look the minutes over from our last meeting, which seems like a long, long time ago. What do you think? Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So approved. Motive. And that's Dr. Thompson. And a second. Nice Please. second. Are Carla, was that you? Yes, okay. that was me. Okay. Are there any additions or corrections for the minutes? If not, all those who uh, approve, uh, say aye or raise your aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> and, and those uh, who don't approve do the same. Minutes are approved as, as submitted to us. Mr. Brown, we are so happy to welcome you today. We're honored. We have had other commissioners come and uh, say hello to the advisory council, but we've never had one who plans to stay from start to finish. And, and for that, we feel really honored. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Some of you already know this and others may not, but uh, I'm a product of the uh, gifted and talented program where, when I went to school in Garrett County and um, I wouldn't be sitting here in this position today uh, were it not for that program. I may not even be sitting here at all, to be honest with you. Uh, it was that important in my life and um, I know the programs that we continue to have, have uh, are also important to our students and we all know though that they are not where they need to be because they are still not adequately funded, which is the uh, overarching problem that we're that we're facing and we will continue to face, unfortunately. But uh, I want to thank you all for what you're doing to uh, make uh, gifted and talented uh, better and serve more kids. And uh, the advisory role that you play is something that we just don't do, just don't do. Uh, as a function and uh, ignore the meeting and then move on. We actually take this advice or at least we do now and, and since I've been at the department and uh, we circle back with our advisory groups and circle that information back to leadership team. Also provide that to the State Board of Education and that's with all of our advisory groups and we have multiple advisory groups, but this is one that's near and dear to my heart, of course, because I was uh, served very well by a gifted and talented programming. So I want to thank you for what all you're doing and taking time today to give us uh, this advice, particularly at a time where we're in uncharted territory um, and uh, uncharted territory and um, we don't exactly know what the uh, next semester will look like and I know you're going to have a lot of uh, 
good conversation when we get to that part of the agenda about some of the reentry guidance that um, we have issued or will be issuing to districts across the state. So, um, and I will tell you, uh, obviously I'm the interim commissioner and uh, this will probably be the first and only time that I'll speak to you in that capacity mm -hmm. as uh, the State Board of Education is well on the way to uh, having a new commissioner. I think we have uh, several finalists and the board is the, they are in the process of using the search firm to do uh, reference checks and background checks and they're going will be continuing to having interviews and continue to narrow the candidates over the next few weeks so i anticipate that uh, we will have a new commissioner name sometime in late july uh, with a hopeful starting date sometime in august and i must say and be honest that while i've enjoyed the challenge of Coming back to be the interim commissioner, I, um, and none of you on this call knew that you'd be serving in your roles during a global pandemic. Uh, it has been uh, interesting, challenging. Uh, there have been some tough days, but I, I can tell you that one of the best things is uh, that I have found is the partnership working in with local school districts. Um, and there's some great stories to tell about things that happened in March and sc schools and districts really rose to the occasion. And uh, I've shared this with some of my colleagues nationally. And of course, I'm a Kentuckian and I believe that we do things better here. Um, but uh, there are very few states uh, and schools and districts across the country that really just said we are going to do what we can. We're going to do the heavy lifting and we're going to continue uh, non-traditional instruction. Even though it is it is imperfect, we are going to do it anyway and we're going to fulfill the minimum our requirements. And uh, I think sometimes we think, well, mo all school districts and all schools around the country must have done that. Well, they didn't. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal on March the 28th and it talked about several states and several districts around the country that said uh, they are going they were going to discontinue um, remote instruction during the pandemic because it was too tough and uh, I was very proud of Kentucky in that despite the challenges of NTI and despite the fact that we did not and were unable to reach every child we continued on so my hat is off to every one of you on this call that made that happen. It is something that you all just considered another day's work, um, but I, you, you need to know that it, it was, uh, history will show it was a very uh, unique thing that happened and, and kids benefit from it. So uh, we're, continuing, we're going to continue to hone that uh, and make uh, non-traditional instruction better because we know, unfortunately, that we may have to pivot to that next semester and you may, you'll hear a little bit about that later on, uh, but I think we're better prepared than we ever have been just because of the learning experience that every school district had so uh, over the last uh, few weeks and months so again thank you we have a, a very uh, heavy agenda today and uh, I know we want to get through everything and have plenty of time for questions I will be on the entire call I have to take a phone call around 11 30 but that should just last a few minutes so uh, I am happy to be here and thank you all for your attendance and your work Welcome, Mr. Brown. We are so happy you are here with us. Thank you. And, and you're right. You didn't sign on for all of this that's happened, but I guess we didn't either. OK, next on the agenda is Lynette, and I don't think she's signed on yet. Yes, is that she you? is. She's she, here. Oh, Can well, you hear Lynette, me? Lynette, you're you up. Well, our, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I hope by now that you would have received your Cage newsletter, but within your newsletter, there is there are certain pages I would like you to pay attention to. If you haven't received it and you don't have uh, access to this information, I'll be happy to send it to April and she can disseminate it. But one of the things that we have done in this time with all that's going on, not only with a pandemic, but with the uh, unrest that's going on in the country. We made a statement on uh, that there's all forms of racism and is committed to working with our members and the community at large to do everything within our power to end racism and the injustices associated with racism in all forms. 
so we're going to be devoting some significant time to uh, within our board meeting as to how we as an organization can work to help to end this issue within the gifted population that we deal with. So there is a, a statement and in a letter to page members, I mean page members and gifted educators, gifted education supporters within the newsletter that I think that you would like to read. So if you don't get a copy of the newsletter and you don't have access to it, it's on page two of the newsletter, let me know and I'll be happy to send it to you. With the pandemic, it created a problem with our summer workshop as to how we wanted to approach professional development this summer. We, um, we usually do, this week would usually be sometime uh, our, our summer workshop, which we deal with on curriculum and differentiation for gifted kids. And it's usually a face-to-face -face meeting in Bowling Green. We switched it to July, uh, and it's going to be a virtual meeting. It's up on the web page. It's on page three of our newsletter when you get it, and it's also online on the page web page if you want to hear more about it. But it's going to be what, why, and what if, igniting inquiry to differentiation for gifted learners in the regular education classroom. Now, when we know that when school does start, that there are going to be some issues with where kids are and where we need to start with them. And I'm hoping that there will be a lot of assessment going on to find out where kids are and then that we be, we're able to pick up and move on with them, especially uh, gifted learners and move on. But Emily Mofield will be the presenter. She is from Nashville. And I'm hoping that uh, the general classroom teacher and the GT coordinator can work together to help bring our gifted kids forward at this time. Uh, that information is online as well as in the new page newsletter. Has anyone gotten the newsletter yet? I haven't gotten mine. No. No? Okay. We have two new cage board members to uh, join our group. Um, Michael Broadbent from um, Breckenridge County is joining us, and Dr. Jillian McCardle from Eastern Kentucky University will be joining us. She's at the model school there, so we're happy to have her with us. Uh, we are going to continue with our update on gifted education workshop in August. At the moment, we're going to do a face-to-face, -face, and we're going to use the auditorium there and space people apart. Um, Encourage people to wear face masks as much as possible there, and we'll see how that goes. The Cage Fall Workshop hasn't been scheduled yet, as well as the annual conference, simply because of the unknowns as to what's going to be happening within our school year. So I'm looking forward to hearing more within this meeting to help help me make some decisions for the Cage Fall Workshop and uh, the annual conference. One of the things that we're really proud of this time is to recognize a young man who is one of our CAGE distinguished students, uh, Lucas Drunk from, um, I want to say Whitley, but I'm not sure it's Whitley. It's McCreary. McCre yeah, McCreary County. Um, Lucas was named a CAGE distinguished student in 2016 and 17, but he has, he was, he had a service project at that time where he was looking for art supplies for students who couldn't afford art supplies. And Lucas uh, has taken his 3D printer and made face shields for, for first responders so and nurses and such. So we're very proud of him for having done it. It just shows what he's Sweetheart, and then you can lay back down. Sit up here and take your medicine. So. Um, mainly with CAGE, what we're doing is looking at the situation and trying to make uh, decisions that are appropriate for the time and still carry out our mission. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. 
if you don't get your Kench newsletter with the articles in it, please let me know so I can see. Any questions? Okay. Thank you for the update, Lynette. Next on our agenda will be Whitney Hamilton, and we'll be looking at a summer learning update. We're glad that you're here. Thank you. Good morning. I'm happy to be here and I'm going to share my screen so that I can show you where our summer learning resources are located. Um, so let me just do the right buttons here to get us to. All right. Are you all able to see my screen now? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so from the um, Kentucky Department of Education homepage, there are a couple of ways to get to our summer support pages. And the first is going to the KDE's COVID-19 webpage. So we can click here and make it to our summer learning uh, summer support pages, or you can scroll down just a little to the families and students section right down here in quick links and go to summer support at the very bottom. So either way, um, we'll get you there. I want to show you if we go through the COVID pages. There are different sections here, categories for finding what you're looking for, and it's under the educate section for learning. And from here we scroll down and underneath learning summer support is at the very bottom of the list. All right, so now we've made it to the main page for summer support and here's where we have all of our resources for summer learning housed. Um, we developed this page for um, all Kentucky students and it but it also is a page that we are um, encouraging our summer boost program um, participants to utilize. So I'll tell you just a little bit about that so that you know that that is happening. We have a summer boost reading and mathematics program um, happening in partnership with the summer food service program as well as the children's reading foundation. We have 19 districts um, that actually applied and are part of that this summer. So they are actually feeding um, students and and helping them with um, summer learning as well. But we definitely had to do some shifts because of COVID-19, how to take that program from a face-to-face -face, um, activity to online. And our summer support pages are a way to enhance that um, learning this summer th for the summer food service programs that are a part of it rather than them reading stories and playing math games with children face to face like they would have been doing. Um, they now have manipulatives that they can share with the families, hand out when they give the food out for lunch um, each day, that we gave them free books that they can give away to students. But then on top of those um, um, take home activities and take home items that they can give to the families, we have provided them access to this summer support page. But again, it doesn't just serve the summer boost um, participants. It's for all Kentucky families to utilize. So once you get to this resources for summer learning, these are the different categories that are available. We do provide a link to summer food service programs because we want to make sure that all families know how to um, access food, access meals for the summer because we know how important that is. Um, we have a link to school and public libraries and we wanted to include this here. Um, we collaborated with a lot of different folks across our agency for this and one being um, uh, James Allen in our um, library media division and he was very adamant that we takes um, families back to their school library, not just the public library and what they have to offer. Um, and thankfully they do have so many virtual options through the public libraries and systems for picking up books in little mailboxes outside while they still can't um, utilize the library inside. But um, it was really important to James that we include the school library as um, um, a, a point of um, um, access for summer learning because 
many schools already have in place, and if not, um, it would be great for them to put in place summer supports through the school um, library or media specialist. So we just want to take um, our families across Kentucky, remind them to check in with their school and see what's available right there close to home. Um, and not always having to, to reach out beyond that local level. But of course, we want to provide um, provide resources if something's not available there at the school level. But we really believe in our schools and want them to start there. We have literacy resources. I mean, a fairly extensive list of resources available for summer learning uh, related to literacy. So here we just have the list and under each of these, there's just a quick little blurb to help them know what that resource offers. So we have KET. We have a specific KET option for activities for exploring at home. PBS learning media. Um, the Kentucky Virtual Library. Library of Congress. National Geographic for kids. So um, National Geographic for kids and Wonderopolis. These are two separate resources, but both that would um, give give families access to content knowledge. So just building knowledge, which we know is helpful to students in becoming better readers. So we wanted to put some things, um, some re resources in here that wouldn't just be specific to being a better reader or being a better writer through skills based activities, but through building knowledge because that in it um, builds interest for students, um, both the the students who would qualify for GT as well as those students who are who may be identified as struggling readers. If we can help them um, find what they're interested in and build their knowledge, then we um, typically make more gains. So we wanted to include some resources that really um, combined not just reading, but content knowledge with that. So we have one here for audiobooks. We have a couple that are um, that are connected to not just reading on your own, but getting to listen to stories online um, that allows students to read or hear stories that may be above their level or something that they're not really able to read on their own yet, but they have a lot of interest in. It also helps include more than one family member, more than one child in the reading process sometimes um, and gives access um, to students in a little uh, in a way too that is engaging for students who are struggling. Of course, I know that that you guys work um, are more, you know working with students who are GT. Um, but one reason that we included this is because audible books are, work great for a variety a variety of listeners and a variety of readers. Um, this audible link um, is normally a paid service, but they have opened up their audible books to um, for free, not all of them, but um, quite a few titles that they have available for free because of COVID-19 and wanting to make uh, stories more accessible to students. And I know my son is in middle school and his um, English language arts teacher uh, recommended this one as well to, to all of her readers. So uh, I wanted to make the point that a lot of these are already being utilized in schools and so um, that helps us feel even better about making these available on our summer learning page because it's it's nice for students to um, and families to have access to what they are already comfortable with. Um, sometimes that comfort level helps them engage in it more likely, but we also added things that we thought they may not know about so that they had some variety. Scholastic um, every year offers a summer summer learning kind of um, a, well, they're calling it Rita Palooza this year, and they usually have one on here where students are um, rewarded for what they read. And this year they're making it more about giving back to the community. So as uh, students can create an account and then as they they read and they log, um, then the uh, Scholastic is giving money back into the community for books for uh, students who may not have access. So that's a bit motivating if um, if students can get into that. And then Reading Rockets is a, a fairly well known resource for teachers and also has um, lots of, of family resources as well. 
So that is an overview of what we have for specific literacy resources. Um, one thing about those literacy resources too that make them good for all readers is that they are uh, most of those of those resource sites do break down their activities into either um, the the skill or an age group or a grade band. So if a student is needing a challenge, there's a wide variety to choose from and they can go above their above their level if that it would be appropriate for them. We have mathematics resources as well. This first one is from Kentucky Family Math Games. So this one is um, especially cool because it highlights a Kentucky teacher. She gave us permission to utilize this video and she's actually a couple of videos here showing these different math games. They are available by grade bands. So for students in grades K1, 2, 3, and four or five. Um, you will notice that several of our of our resources, most of the resources are geared more toward elementary. That is our, our, our focus, that is our intended audience, but there are things for, for older kids as well. Um, we're really working though to target those um, earliest readers so that we can make gains with them as we know how important early learning is. So we have these videos for each. Um, this also is a great support for our summer boost program for the, the 19 districts I mentioned at the beginning who are offering support through their feeding programs. We had hoped we gave them um, um, card decks and uh, dice and they were going to actually play the games with the students right there when they came to pick up their food. Um, but because of COVID, we can't do that. But here we have uh, models for them of what playing these games can look like and how it should look. All right. In addition to right here in Kentucky resources um, that I was showing you, we give them access to several others. We have learning heroes. Another website called how to learn math math visuals and math before bed and again these resources are divided by grade bands and age groups and different skills to help you know um, what would be best for the students that you're working with and to give um, a variety of differentiated learning. Uh, virtual read aloud series is the next on our list of summer learning. And this one we're really proud of. Um, usually with our Summer Boost program, we send guest readers out to the different districts at their summer feeding programs and send those actual you know, live guest readers to them. They read with the students there. They talk to families. Uh, we usually use KDE staff and sometimes local celebrities for that area. We coordinate and get those folks to go out and read with students. Because of COVID-19, of course, we could not do that this summer. So we decided to have a virtual read aloud series. So we've been recording different folks from around Kentucky, including some high school uh, graduates, high, some Kentucky um, high school graduates are involved in this as well as KDE staff. We have a local um, Kentucky author that's going to be recorded soon. And so um, families can come here and click on a story and hear it read aloud and they can click on it as many times as they want and read those stories again and again. We continue to add to these. We even have First Lady Brittany Bashir. She read for us. And so, like I said, we continue to add to these. We're going to add through the month of June and then they will stay up throughout the summer. If you happen to see one disappear, it's just due to copyright. Um, we had to make sure of that, so you you may see some. There's Dr. Amanda Ellis. Um, she has been really the um, the instigator behind our our summer learning and just done so much to make sure that this has been successful um, and a, a very uh, well-rounded program. So 
um, I want to make sure she does the, the kickoff here. I want to make sure I give props to her for that. And she does the kickoff and, and reads Swimmy to the group. It's really awesome. All right, and the um, second to last is information and printables for families and caregivers. I want to show you this one because um, the more we can help educate or give give access to education to parents to help them know um, things they can be doing at home just naturally, um, the better. The CCSSO Virtual Summer School Resources Guide, I'm going to let you know that's here. Um, that was um, more uh, timely, uh, you know, several weeks ago. This actually gives guidance for if you're having summer, um, so some kind of um, summer, um, oh, summer school, like summer school programs going on. So this was some guidance that CCSSO put out um, that we wanted to make available for folks who were working on on summer summer school type of sessions this summer. So that's a little little outdated at this point, um, but some folks may still be working on those plans, so we still have it here for them. But I would like to show you the information and printables for families and caregivers um, before we wrap up um, summer learning and see what questions you may have. All right, so you did hear me say that we partnered with the Children's Reading Foundation for our summer boost program with the summer feeding program and so these are these documents are um, from the children's reading foundation we have uh, reading tracker bookmarks and if you you can click on these and on the back of them they have um, the days of the week and that way students can check off that they've done their reading. Even if the family doesn't have access to print these off, they can at least um, take a look at them on here and um, you know, look at it each day and say, okay, have we done our reading today? Um, they might even, you know, if they were to have access to, to opening it in a way that they could digitally check it off, that would be an option. Um, and I'll just click on one of these. Um, for instance, the read 20 minutes every day. That's really what we're promoting, the importance of reading 20 minutes every day. And this gives tips and reasons behind why that should happen, the benefits of it. So you can see the list here of different reasons why. Really user friendly. Making the most of reading aloud with children, our virtual summer read aloud series hopefully is modeling that for families as well and what that should look like or what it could look like. Um, many of our readers stop along the way and ask questions um, to the to the read, you know, to the listeners um, and, and show how to engage in a story as you read. So these are available, like districts can print them off if they would like to and make them available, um, or they can just be read digitally. These are available in Spanish as well. That's why you see them twice. Um, it may not be very visible from me sharing the screen. I'll try to scroll in a little bit here. Um, but yeah, we have them in English and in Spanish. The math games, the Kentucky math games that I showed you, those are available in Spanish as well. And at the bottom of each of these summer learning pages, there is an email address so that if our users have questions, want to learn more, we always provide that contact information and are happy to answer questions. So that is a high level overview of our summer learning um, that's available this summer. Are there any questions? I have one. Sure. Uh, to what extent will this uh, site be maintained or added to or whatever uh, as the school year begins, knowing that there's a possibility that they may need to go into quarantine again or maybe not. Right, so that's a great question. And um, I think Krista Hall's on the phone and she may want to chime in on this as well. Uh, right now we are you know, committed to maintaining it through the through the summer months, at least through mid August um, to late August, just because you know we're not sure of those start dates um, just yet, and we know those will likely to vary. But we will definitely maintain it that long, and then we do not want to lose these resources. So they will likely um, can't be certain of what they will look like or what the name of the page might be. But we would like to to definitely keep the resources because, as you're saying, they would be great for utilization by teachers and or parents at home 
on their own. So not sure what it may look like. Um, definitely the name would change. But Krista, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, Whitney, what you said is exactly correct, that we do want to keep these available for our schools, recognizing that how the fall is going to look, uh, we're not sure of that at this point. We do, uh, we are aware that there may be changes though, as uh, some of the resources that Whitney showcased uh, that uh, those companies may be offering for free right now. Hopefully, if the um, as the COVID-19 continues, if there is a reemergence and, and much of the nation um, goes back under a lockdown, you know, they will continue offering those services for free. But many of them have dates where they're only available for a certain period of time. So as they remove the, that ability, we would then, um, of course, keep the, the sites up to date with those resources. But we agree we want to make these available. And as Whitney said, we, we would just transition it, no, not necessarily from summer support, but for some online support. Um, and then have that available for our, our families and our schools and our districts. Thank you for the question. Dr. Roberts, I think you're on mute. The Kentucky Association for Gifted Education has a resource page that is available. Um, and you might want to look at that for some other resources that could be made available. Oh, sure. Thank you for mentioning that. Is there a username? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that question. Is there a username, password available? Uh, required for any of this not to not to access the the main page so what you see on the screen right now our summer support main page there are there's no username or passwords required to get to this point when you get to some of those uh, literacy or math resources uh, the, the majority of them are just open and you just hop right into them and use them as you need to with no username or password. But for instance, the Scholastic uh, Rita Palooza one, that one does require students to create an account, but there's no it's there's no cost associated with it. Um, and the, the activities are still available, but if you want to get into that actual summertime um, specific um, events, then you do need the, the username and password, but you create that yourself. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. Are there questions? Well, thank you immensely for the update. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And we'll move on with Krista Hall and Lisby Higgins on reentry guidance, and they're from Teaching and Learning. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Uh, we definitely appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. Um, I have uh, placed the guiding question in the chat box. But our guiding question um, around what we're presenting today is how are GT teachers involved with the uh, process of academic academic reentry planning? So uh, just recently we posted a three part webcast to support academic reentry in the fall. And really the purpose of this webcast was to provide guidance for teachers to follow a step-by-step -step process to analyze what they actually were able to teach during the 1920 school year, all of the school year, not just what happened during the extended remote time, but what they were actually able to teach during that entire school year. And then taking that information to make informed decisions about how they may need to adjust their upcoming curriculum for the fall um, for the 2021 school year. 
we recognize right now that there are still so many unknowns, uh, whether school is going to be face to face or if it's going to be virtual or if there's going to be a hybrid model or as Commissioner Brown said, we may start one way and have to pivot to another direction. This is work that our teachers can be working on right now to really be analyzing uh, what they were able to teach so that they are ready to make those decisions in the fall. And I want to say that um, there are so many components to reentry. And uh, while academic reentry is just one of those pieces, we feel that it, you know, is one of um, the one of the more essential pieces we recognize safety and health and social emotional wellness um, is uh, at the forefront as well but but we don't want uh, to wait until those decisions are made to begin thinking about the academic pieces so i want to invite my colleague misty higgins to share a little more specific about um, the the webcast series that was provided and then we welcome any of your suggestions or feedback as we really think about uh, the academic reentry process. Good morning everyone and thank you Krista and like she was saying really the purpose of our first webcast series and the first um, guidance document that we released was to help teachers really plan for and adjust their curriculum heading into the 2021 school year. And again, there may be a lot of unknowns, but the purpose of the guidance that we created was regardless of which situation in which we may start school, teachers still need to have a curriculum in place in order to start that school year. So the curriculum itself will not as likely be impacted by the way in which we may start school. And in that process, what we did, um, it's it's all about the teachers working together with um, not just the regular classroom teachers, but working with their special ed teachers, working with the gifted teachers, all trying to figure out, like looking at their 1920 curriculum. So for the school year that just wrapped up, looking at that and saying what did we teach that is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards for this grade level that we know we at a minimum must keep this in our curriculum next year in order for students to meet the grade level expectations of the standards because ultimately what teachers need to do is they need to create some time within their curriculum next year to be able to address the knowledge gaps that kids may be coming in with from this year and even for many of our gifted students, you know, we've been talking with different districts and um, different individuals, and we know that some kids, um, especially gifted kids, flourish during the independent learning and the remote learning, whereas others really did kind of check out and they didn't hear from them as much. So across the board, we know that kids are going to potentially come in with gaps from the extended remote learning that happened this spring. So teachers, they sit down, they work together to see what do we absolutely need to keep in our curriculum next year in order to ensure that students are still going to meet the grade level expectation and then they sit down as a team and they look at what is it that we taught during extended remote learning where there may be gaps for our kids or what did we not even get to in our curriculum because of the extended remote learning and as they put that to paper they share that information with the grade level above through vertical conversations so that the grade level above has that information to build it into their curriculum next year to say this is where we anticipate the gaps being and so what teachers are going to start with next year is this kind of cold down um, curriculum that is essential for meeting grade level standards but also has the identified gaps from the previous grade level now one thing i do think is so incredibly important is to know that this feeds into the stage two guidance that we are going to be releasing in July, because even though we may be starting with a curriculum that has just the essential of what we know kids have to know and be able to do, we know that as teachers utilize good formative assessment practices next fall, they are going to get a better judge of where their kids actually are, both on the identified gaps and on current grade level standards so that they can enrich and extend as needed, as well as remediate for those who may need it. So it allows for better differentiation once the school year starts. So stage two that we will release in July is all about formative assessment evidence based practices that really help us to meet the needs of all the learners that may be sitting in our classrooms. So I'm going to turn that back over to you, Krista, in case anyone has questions or suggestions for us in this work. 
Thank you, Misty. And and I just want to reiterate with the stage two that's coming up in July, you know, as Lynette was mentioning in the very beginning, uh, talking about when schools get back into session, really starting out with that formative assessment to figure out where the students are, because we, we can't make assumptions that um, that all students had gaps or um, make the assumptions that they're where they typically are when they come back in, in previous years, because this upcoming year is going to be like no other. So that formative assessment process will be so essential to determining uh, how much time to spend in content. You know, maybe we'll be able to make up more time uh, when we recognize where our students are. And so we are looking very forward to uh, getting that guidance out in July as well. So at this time, if you have any feedback or suggestions for us as we are uh, preparing that guidance, we welcome that um, so that we can be uh, cognizant of that as we um, continue to develop that work to make sure that it's included. Uh, you could either put that in the chat box or if you just want to unmute and speak, either way works for us. I just had a real quick question. So we, um, I work at a high school, and so I, I would be interested to know what your all's thoughts are on um, working with uh, from one year to the next with like with nonlinear classes. So like you've got a class that uh, kids this year are taking world history, and next year they're taking U.S. history, and so it's not a case of you know one teacher can just say, oh, we didn't get to cover these units. Let me pick those up. Well, those teachers may not really be specialists in that in that area. And it may be really, really difficult for a teacher just to pick up and fill in the gaps that a kid missed in a previous year. It makes a little bit more sense in middle school and elementary school, I think. In high school, I just wonder what kind of thoughts have been put into um, how to make that work in a high school setting. And in our guidance document under our leadership considerations, we looked at some different approaches that schools or districts might use in addressing the knowledge gaps that the teachers have identified. And one of those options is front loading. So at the beginning of the year when the kids come back is really front loading where those gaps might be from the previous year. And one reason at the high school level I think that could be beneficial is because then you might have a little bit more opportunity for teachers to like help each other out, even if it means there at the beginning we're going to switch classes for the day, like you're going to come in and teach my kids, if that makes sense, because we're front loading all of that in the beginning because it doesn't embed itself as well into their particular curriculum. Um, because I think you're going to have the same possible conversation around math when you move from like geometry to algebra two. Those may or may not be able to embed as easily. So what can you front load at the beginning of the year and how can you kind of play with the schedule a little bit to allow teachers to kind of move around to be able to come and address that? But I agree there's th those are the tough situations um, at the high school level that are pretty unique to the high school level. Yeah, we've, we've even talked about possibly going back and looking at models where <clears throat> our kids return to their schedules from last year um, for for a period of time uh, and then having the the senior level teachers pick up the freshmen for you know maybe for a few weeks or whatever and let our let our sophomores juniors and and our current sophomores juniors and seniors um, return to their last year's teachers um, or their replacements if they have a replacement at this point and try to fi finish it out that way so yeah, it's going to be that's that's going to be the mess for for us to, you know, to kind of figure out to get those kids to the right level, because that the other thing I was just going to throw in and it's it's not really I guess it's 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 sort of similar to the fall, because if we if we do end up with a period where we're going to have to be out of school again for weeks or months at a time, um, one of the <clears throat> I'm an assistant principal at, a, at Oldham County High School and, um, you know, I think about our kids and, you know, our county is considered to be like the most affluent county in the state. And so you think, oh, laptops and Internet abound. Everybody everybody has all the all the stuff that they need. And one of the <clears throat> one of the roles, because obviously as an assistant principal being on NTI, it was very difficult for me to um, be much more than a support to the teachers and the, and the students. And so one of the roles that I took on was um, I was doing all the home visits for our kids that were basically dropping out. Like, like we didn't we could we hadn't heard from them. We didn't know. And what was really the, I guess the the beneficial, I don't want to say fun, that's not really what it was, but the beneficial thing to me as a school leader was to to see where our kids live and where our, what our kids are dealing with. And we had a ton of kids that had spotty Wi-Fi, 
Um, they were going to work. They were taking care of siblings. They um, were living in trailers where you could see inside of the inside of the of the trailer, you know, because it was op- it was it was open. Um, and I just I just think, uh, you know, if we end up going to another NTI model where we're going to be out of school for any period of time, like I, I've kind of advocated to our to our administration, like I don't know how that we continue to do new learning during that time because it's just so um, disproportionate what the kids have and how they can continue in that in that model. It's so difficult just to we're just going to plow ahead and keep going um, because there's just so many kids that just they just physically can't. And then you've got a ton of kids that won't, you know, that they have difficulty just because they're at home by themselves and they're told to just keep doing stuff. So it's just a it's a really um, it's just really awful. Like it's really a bad it's really a bad situation for a lot of kids. And Joe, I think what you're talking about includes many gifted kids who live yeah. and, and, and they certainly have not thrived with NTI. Um, for many of our gifted kids, there was really no new content or limited new content, almost nothing mm. that would challenge them to think at high levels. And uh, if we have to pivot back in that direction again, there is a huge gap in learning for many students, including those who could learn at the fastest pace and the most complex levels. Well, the other, the other thing that I would add on to that is we also know that that gifted kids, um, um, you know, also have those heightened sensibilities, the social social emotional aspects. I dealt with a student um, a few weeks ago who was a GT kid, but his mom is a, a healthcare worker, and so she is out, and he's an only child. Um, parents are divorced. So this kid was at home by himself for the entire NTI period. Um, and he really struggled. Um, I mean, I don't know, had we given him, that, that's the other aspect of it is we, you know, we think, oh, we, we want to challenge those kids and make sure that they're continuing to move forward. But had he received too much challenge, honestly, he probably would have had a mental breakdown at some point because he was so stressed from being at home by himself and having to manage all of this stuff. Um, that he was, he was, you know, tipping the other way. Like he was almost like, it was almost too much stress for him. Um, and so it, it's just a really difficult thing all around for all the kids. I would also add that, um, not to make this even more complicated, but, you know, I think we think of, we're still thinking of it in terms where the entire district would, or state would go to NTI. And what we're looking at now is more likely that, um, and the governor talked about this a little bit on the um, press conference last night due to contact tracing. It may be a case of where we can be very targeted to have only certain classes and certain um, buildings or schools or regions go to NTI. So that's a little better. But then also need to be keeping in mind that we're hearing from um, a lot of districts and uh, a lot of this is the result of surveys that are being sent out by districts over the summer that even if we don't go to NTI for public health reasons or we're or as a whole school or a whole district or a whole state, we're hearing that a lot of parents um, are, or some parents are saying, I don't know that I'm comfortable sending my child to school this year, even if it opens for in-class instruction. Therefore, I may keep them home. Districts, of course, and they should be doing this, are planning to try to deliver uh, NTI and virtual instruction, remote instruction to those students while the students' classmates will be sitting in a classroom, even though they will be social distancing and et cetera. And so that's a, adding another layer of complexity to it. Um, that's the right approach to continue to educate those kids. But um, the, you know, what you uh, brought up, Joe, is exactly right. Um, NTI was a great solution, as imperfect as it was for the initial emergency. But if we're, it is, and it is here, I think, with us in some form or capacity um, as we move forward, because we know we're going to have some parents that want to keep their children home. And we know there may be some scheduling that districts have to do to maintain social distancing where they're in some type of alternative pattern where at least a few days a week they are in some type of remote instruction. We've got to continue to refine that and address that issue. And if you're having that problem in Oldham County, which is perceived to be a pretty, you know, a, a county that has um, a lot of resources or more than many. We know that it's got to be um, obviously even worse in other districts. So uh, thank you for that. It's very helpful. 
I think the only other thing that I would throw in too is, and I'm sure that you're doing this, and you may have even mentioned it before, I may have missed it, is I, as you guys are coming through and you're putting together guidance, um, I would just really encourage, I, it's one of the things that, I mean, not that we don't know this, but it's just one of the things that we learn is, um, is, to, is to constantly include um, current teachers in that process. Um, and, and to make sure that as we come up with models and say, you know, this is this is what we're thinking, like this is what we're this is what our guidance is going to be to um, to make sure that that teachers are looped in on that to give to give feedback because um, they can they've lived now lived with NTI for multiple months and they can tell you that's not going to work or here's why I'm concerned about that or I'm not sure how that's going to work with my kids um, because. Um, I, I just rem I think back to March, whatever that day was, Mar whatever that Friday was, March 13th or 12th or whatever that was. We had a teacher work day in our county, and we were basically planning for two weeks of NTI at that point um, to get us to spring break. And then we were planning we will be back, you know, we'll be back after spring break and everything. And I just think back to the conversations that we had um, that day, and it said, uh, you know, it was it was just like, oh, we'll just do this. You know, this is this will work and we'll just do this. And now looking back on those conversations, like not that we were, you know, dumb or anything, but like we were just naive about like what we could do and what our kids could do and what our teachers could handle. Um, and I just think that they've got a wealth of knowledge now. A lot of the teachers that have really lived with this now for several months could be great, great resources to come back and go that that may not work. And here's why or here's a way that would make it work better. And I think it'd be really um, really a good thing to loop those teachers in and um, let the teachers know that like we we've, we've really done that research to say um, you know we've got feedback from your colleagues to say that this is a workable model and, and we, we want to try to get this into your hands so that you can do the best that you can for your kids. So. And Joe, one we thing that I would add to that as well is um, in our stage two guidance, one thing we're trying to be very cogn or cognizant of is we know from various different groups that we've had the chance to talk to, um, we've gotten some great feedback from them of where they feel like teachers struggled. And so one of the things we kept consistently hearing they struggled in how do I give my kids feedback in a timely manner and help the learning move forward. Um, we also just heard about how does that all of this look virtually like I get it in my classroom. I can apply evidence based practices in my classroom, but how do I transfer that virtually? And so in our stage two guidance, we're trying to make sure we think through and offer. OK, here are these strategies that are best around formative assessment. But what does that look like in a classroom setting and how might you apply that in a virtual setting so that we can help meet those needs that we're hearing? from the teachers. Uh, I have a question. This is Dr. Thompson again, uh, and really, I guess it's from Misty Higgins. Uh, I have, you know, numerous questions or concerns and comments, but it's, it's, they're too lengthy for, for a meeting like this, and I just wanted to kind of get some information. Uh, would you be the person to send an email to, or would it be someone else? or? My guess is, and Krista, would it be both of us that they we could in the chat put our emails? Yes, I'll add both of our emails, Dr. Thompson, and you can reach out to uh, both of us. And if we're not the correct people, we will definitely get you to the correct people. OK, all right, thanks. Are there other questions this is such a huge topic and so incredibly important. Uh, this is Joe. I just want to add that I really appreciate that feedback that was provided because I think it's very important that we we understand at actually what's playing out and what's happening. And so this feedback is very valuable to us because as Kevin talked about some of the options that we're considering and the guidance that we're trying to help provide and, and the models that we're trying to consider for going back. I think it's very critical that we 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 hear the voice of how that's playing out locally. So uh, continue to provide that feedback so that um, we know that the guidance we're providing is um, is something that's reasonable, manageable and really keeping ki our kids, you know, at, at best interest. So I appreciate that. Anything else you want to say or ask? Well, thank you immensely. 
Misty and Krista for, for coming to share with us. I know that you'll remember that gifted kids fall in every category of child there is. Um, Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today and to, and to receive that feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next thing on our agenda is to look at discussion items. Is there any interest in a five minute break? Or are we okay to just roll right on? Well, let's keep rolling on. Um, April? Yes, ma'am. Why don't you share initially? Sure. Those of you um, who've been with the committee for at least a year will remember that we were working on, well, you all were working on, um, two pieces of um, guidance information for um, various audiences. One was on performing and visual art resources, and one was on social and emotional learning. Um, because we had to reschedule, this meeting was originally scheduled in March, so it feels like this conversation's coming way late, but it's just because everybody was in the middle of the COVID crisis and everybody trying to respond to what they needed to do in their roles, so we moved it and, and just trying to find the right schedule after that. But I wanted to bring those back to the table and let you know where we're at, and I need a little input from the committee. Let's start with the um, visual performing arts. Um, what was created originally out of the committee was a brochure, brochure of sorts with lists and lists of resources. Um, we were concerned um, in, the, in the office that maybe a different format and maybe a little um, culling of those resources might be helpful. It's overwhelming to look at. Um, it's it, it, trying to make sure all the links are up to date and make yeah, some of them have already, the resource has already been taken down and there were 15, 20 resources in one category and 15 or 12 or 15 in another. It just was very overwhelming. So um, originally Dina was supposed to come back with some discussion options but now, of course, I'm going to be uh, doing that for you. The question is, do you still want a document of sorts or would putting it in a particular place on the website, like uh, having a visual and performing arts page with several resources in each section be more effective and easier to update? Um, and then maybe a fast five kind of thing video where you know we go over a few resources um, in each category either as one complete fast five or have that be one of the things on the fast five for a couple months in a row we're just trying to find a better way to put out the resources in such a way that they're helpful rather than overwhelming we don't want people to just go i don't have time to go through all that so that's the discussion question Okay, I'm going to weigh in on that if you don't mind a little Absolutely. bit because I was helpful. Uh, it was a couple of us working to put that together. Um, my concern at this point about doing anything with this document is a lot of arts organizations are still trying to figure out how they're going to come out of this uh, COVID-19 situation. Um, a lot of those resources may no longer exist. Um, arts areas, arts, community arts organizations are struggling right now because of wanting to try to, to offer programming and offer, you know, student field trips. Well, things like that may, may not be possible in the near future. So some of the larger organizations like here in town, the um, Lexington Children's Theater or um, the Kentucky Center for the Arts in Louisville, you know, those organizations I think are going to come out okay. But some of the smaller more recent organizations are going to have a little bit of difficulty with this. So for right now, um, I'm not really sure how to guide this other than a website would probably be the best because it's easier to update than a document uh, and have some resources. But probably 
probably go and just focus on the larger organizations for now and then add back some of the smaller, more uh, localized or more regional um, offerings. Like I said, there's some some organizations that may or may not come back from this, and we don't know what field trips are going to look like. The um, Kentucky Arts Council, for example, one of their big programs is uh, visiting artist programs uh, where they have a visiting artist that a student, uh, a school or a district can get a grant for that artist to come. It's like a two to one match, if I remember correctly, where they would pay some of the money and then Kentucky Arts Council would fund and then this visiting artist would go and spend two weeks in a school. That may or may not be possible at this point. So this is a little bit difficult. Um, so those are my thoughts. I, I think a website would be the best, but at this point, um, that list will definitely need to be uh, culled tremendously at this point, and then things added back in. Okay. Uh, I'll add a little something. Uh, I would like to see, uh, and I'm not sure how it would work or how it would actually end up performing, uh, with a website for it to be possible for districts, teachers who did something with visual and performing arts that was something that they thought was a good idea along those lines to contribute to the site, maybe filter it through April or someone and say, here's what we've done. Uh, this could be possible in your district, uh, add it to the website. I think that would be a good thing, sort of would be sort of uh, in a way interactive and get input from the districts out there. Absolutely. And we could even feature a, a district program if we have one that, you know, a, a little blurb on a, on a fast five or, you know, we could share out a little video about that with GT coordinators so that, you know, that's absolutely doable. It's kind of interesting if this question had, if we had had a March meeting, the answer to your question, April, would have been very, very different. different than it is today. So maybe, um, Carla, I know Justin was involved. Who else was involved with you on this one? Taylor helped some too, but it was mainly Justin and me. Okay, so maybe you could look at the list and bring someone else in and what what are things that seem to be okay for the moment if there are any in the arts and, and that's a good question because like i said the arts organizations right now are trying to figure out how to do their own programming for yes, yes. performances and things because performance venues are not opening up yet you're, Const you're so maybe this is just for another time that we would bring this topic up. Honestly, I don't think that we could actually do anything with this at this point until, like I said, performance arts, performing arts venues are not concerts, symphonies, plays. Those things are not happening right now. And so it's difficult to say what is legitimate what is legitimately something that a teacher could plan for in the fall because if you're doing a field trip or if you're doing wanting to go to a performance or have a visiting artist those things take months of planning um and so i i don't know i i think this probably is something we need to table until august to maybe the august meeting and revisit and see at that point what the arts world looks like well i know as my school I'm, I'm, a, I'm in a school for the arts and we don't know what our performances are going to look like in the fall or how we're going to be doing things we're struggling with the fact that how are we going to have vocal classes choral classes when people are discouraged from singing in large groups with each other and you know how are you going to do this how are you going to do a band class how are you going to do a marching band how are you going to do a dance class when you've got when you have teachers who are needing to help students, you know, align their hands or do this and 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 touch them in order to be able to do things like that. How do you do that in, in a social distancing world? So I know schools are struggling with how they're even going to implement visual and performing arts in their schools. And right now, 
looking at bringing in outside unless it's something that's done virtually and i'm not sure what is being being done virtually to put offerings together right now i really i really don't see this as as productive at this point because there's too many unknowns so let's perhaps table that discussion for august yeah. okay do we need a can we just table it joe or do we need a motion and a second and a vote no no i think you can um you can plan to table that and put that on your next agenda okay and maybe i use too specific a, a, a verb for that maybe we'll <laughs> just put it off and there and, you go <laughs> i just wanted yeah. to make sure that was we'd follow the right rules there so yeah yeah okay. but you're right that that's that's a conversation that's gonna require a lot of time and commitment my can you hear me yes my daughter is doing recitals on uh, virtually and um let me, let me. and then the the teacher i'm getting echoing the teacher is combining all of the individual recitals into a um you know into a group production on it virtually so it, it's it it is she's an elementary though so it's not as important at that and she's also doing uh harmony with the teacher in other words she is the teacher is playing the harmony and she's playing the melody with with the if that's any help at all oh uh, yeah I trust me as a more how she's doing it what what virtual reality she's using yeah one of the most common ones is a program called flipgrid i've used that with my own piano recital students we've used that for a showcase for our eighth graders we've used it for a variety of different things um, there's a lot of individual platforms out there and that's a different topic for a different discussion which is virtual resources for arts teachers but um as far as community resources, that's what that particular document was about, was what community resources are out there so that teachers can supplement what they're doing with community arts resources. So that's that's the unknown at this point as to gotcha. how that's going to look. OK, all right. So the other um, piece of guidance that uh, we were working on um, was the social and emotional guidance. And again, um, you know, it's it's been through the editing process at KDE and through communications at KDE. Um, we teased apart the 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 original um, public document had um, some guidance for parents and some guidance for educators. So we kind of teased them apart so that, you know, we could have the audiences um, very clearly defined. Um, and again, the question just becomes if you want that to be a um, you know like a one pager fact sheet resource or if you would again like to have that be part of the website so that we could continue to update or add things or change things a little more easily um, than we could with with a, a full document thoughts from the group We can absolutely continue with the document as it is. That That is not a problem. I just wanted to be sure since some time had lapsed that we were all on that same page. Well, sometimes it's handy when you're working with a group of parents or sharing with parents to have a document, a one page document. And couldn't that also be up on the I think we've solved that. Yeah, sorry about that, Dr. Roberts. Well, I'm sorry about it. Yes, we can absolutely post that to the web page. That's that's not an issue. Whether it's a you know a one page guidance, it can be added to the website. Yes.
OK, so I'll assume that's the direction we'll move in a document um, and then post the document to the website. All right. And Dr Roberts, you had some things. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you. I do. Did any of you uh, have the opportunity to read the document that uh, April sent out for me yesterday or have you read it previously? It came out in January, so it's not a absolutely new document, but it is, I think, a very important document from the Education Trust on the inequities of advanced coursework. Uh, I read it. Thoughts on how this council would uh, take that as, as one source of information. And, and of course, for me, it, it ties right into all of the racial unrest that we're looking at right now across the world and certainly across the United States. I would suggest, this is Taylor again, The uh, when I was reading it, the first probably half of it, I was thinking they're looking only at race and ethnicity rather than family income and education background as a criteria here. But then toward the end, it got a little bit better because they made some recommendations of questions to ask and also some policies that school districts might need to adopt to allow more equity in the access to advanced courses. Uh, it is a nationwide document, does not center on Kentucky, so you'd have to kind of, you know, focus a little bit more on the Kentucky situation. Uh, the only question I had as a college person and not a, a, a person of a secondary experience is what are the criteria for admitting students to advanced courses? Uh, is it a state policy or their district policies? And that would be a big question that we would need to look at. Other thoughts? Julia, when I looked at it, I thought I went into some of the data tool, tools and Kentucky doesn't fare well within the data tools. If you look to see where Kentucky is, so it shows us that there is work that needs to be done. Um, maybe the council can take a deeper dive into it and see what it is that they can advise um, folks to do whether it be KDE or just put out a general statement. I'd like to suggest that we uh, have this document as a source of discussion at our next meeting and that everyone look at it, read it, if you go into it, you can press on Kentucky data. Um, that's not, well, it, as you read it online, it will tell you where you can do that. And uh, I, I think it's probably an incredibly important activity for this group to be involved with and to make as uh, a, a major point of discussion when we meet the next time. OK. Um, other questions that have been brought to me um, that the council really probably needs to uh, provide some advice for districts on. And one of those is how can we encourage districts to identify students in social studies and science with the state testing not being a source and the elimination of uh, the requirement for anything for s districts to do that would indicate young people who were at the top with science or social studies or the potential to be exceptional. Could we have a small group look at this with a recommendation to come back in August with uh, 
some information on this and I, I'll volunteer to be one of the people. Would anyone work with me on that? Joe? I will, Dr. Roberts. Deanna. Oh, hi, Deanna. Okay, Deanna and Joe. I think we, we need some guidance. And I can work with you just in setting up the meeting and helping to do the technology portion of that, if you'd like. And we'll, we'll certainly take you up on that. Absolutely. Um, another suggestion that was offered to me was that in special education, there's been quite a bit of guidance for looking at the IEPs for the beginning of the school year in light of the pandemic, and that perhaps some guidance needs to be offered for our IEPs that we call GSSPs for, for gifted students. Is anything being thought about with that, April? And I know you're very shorthanded in, in this regard. I hope not to be forever, just well. to say. But um, yes, we, we always do a beginning of the year training with our GT coordinators. Um, and that is one of the things that we have bounced around. We don't have a formal agenda yet. We're just now thinking about it, but uh, definitely that, you know, those need to be reviewed and um, But I anything from this group in terms of what, you know, specifically you feel like should be covered. Um, and if it's not just for the coordinators or, you know, whatever, I will take back and we can discuss. Any Dr. Roberts, I also want to make sure that, you know, um, our associate commissioner, Greta Hilton, is, is on here with us today and listening to the conversation. And Greta has been working with our staff to really look at the guidance and support that we're providing to support special education and early learning. And so, um, yes, you're exactly right. Some of the processes we have in place to support special education, we're, we're very interested in hearing feedback about that also. But um, but Greta is definitely in tune to that if she would like to add anything. Hello, Greta, and we welcome you to our- Hi, how are you? Um, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Dr. Roberts, for that um, for that reminder to have that discussion today. Um, in the reopening guidance, when um, the Office of Special Education and Early Learning was looking at um, specific requirements for students, we looked at students um, as exceptional learners rather than focusing, you know, specifically on students with disabilities, because even as you know, uh, many students with um, that are identified as gifted and talented may also indeed have a disability or um, they are definitely unique learners just, you know, by the nature of their giftedness. Um, so we included that as part of that. We're also gearing up. Um, I just spoke with directors on Friday and we're gearing up to do um, a um, additional guidance, if you will, for exceptional learners. And so we definitely will take your recommendations um, under consideration and include that as part of our guidance. And I appreciate you um, for, for bringing that up to the group. And we feel uh, that it's really important that uh, gifted kids are identified as exceptional learners in Kentucky and the law calls the GSSP an IEP. So in, in that regard, uh, it's very important that we have that guidance and thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Any other comments on, on that that we could pass along to Greta? Well, just know we'd be glad to talk with you about it. Um, One of the things that would be really nice uh, to do would be to have a way to present on gifted children to the state board. How would we go about creating that opportunity? Mr. Brown, are you here or are you away at your phone call? I'm here. Any thoughts on how we might have an opportunity to create an awareness with the state board of gifted kids and uh, the, the law and the, the regulation and the possibilities for them. 
Uh, it was probably a great opportunity with the new commissioner coming in this fall to do that. Um, and um, and that's also something that um, Greta and I can talk to uh, current chair uh, Young. Lou Young's the current board chair. We can certainly, Greta, if you will mark that down and you and I can have that conversation with her. Uh, you know that we'll have we have a new, we will have a new commissioner. Uh, all the board members are new. Of course, they are not new to education, but I new to the new to the state board. A great group of members, um, and I think that would be well received. And we can discuss with them uh, about the best format for that to happen. Um, and then, somewhat related, uh, the the student member may or may not be a gifted and talented student, but uh, there will be uh, the lieutenant governor has announced the intent to add a student member, a student non voting member to the board. So, uh, you know, I think student voice and needs obviously are going to be first and foremost for this board. And I think for the that's what they're looking for in the next commissioner. So uh, I, I think the discussion that you're suggesting will is right on target and would be well received. Good, thank you. And if you want any information from us, I certainly would be glad to visit about it. And, and of course, this has to be part of a larger conversation of um, funding. And we know we're probably going into an, another cycle of, uh, at least we know state revenues are going to be reduced in the short term, at least, but just because of the economic downturn, um, we know that that could impact uh, school funding. We know that uh, GT funding is nowhere where it needs to be. Um, and so obviously that, that's a the uh, issue that still needs to be uh, discussed and remedied in some form or fashion. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And we'll look forward to that. Um, some things that um, I've written recently, and it's very small. It was for a blog that's going to be published in New Zealand, but it's looking at the gaps that we're focusing on, and I'd be, I'll be glad to send it out to you. But, you know, we often hear about the achievement gap, but I believe there are two gaps that precede that, and one of them is the belief gap, and isn't that really what's causing so much of, of the uh, unrest and uncertainty that uh, if you, if teachers don't believe that children from low income families can achieve at really high levels, they're not likely to do that or and you can fill in the blanks on that. So it starts with the belief gap. The second gap is the opportunity gap. So if children don't have opportunities to do um, activities both in and out of school, they miss the opportunity then to excel in some areas, perhaps never even get interest created in a particular area. The research that uh, has been done down at Vanderbilt suggests that out of school opportunities have a huge impact on interests as they develop talents as they develop and consequently occupations. So you've got the belief gap, the opportunity gap, and then the achievement gap. And we've heard so much about the achievement gap. We know that one well. We know that groups who have not excelled um, in terms of reaching grade level, and please remember proficient means grade level achievement. And that's a wonderful goal unless you're already there or beyond, and then it's no goal at all. And the fourth gap is the excellence gap. And you all have, have, have heard that mentioned. Jonathan Plucker uh, initiated the term and has developed so much, but this is looking at children in your district who are achieving at advanced levels, but looking at the same groups for doing that. And until there is an awareness of the gaps, we are probably not going to be making the, the steps forward that, that we might. 
I think some of you are very aware that with all of the racial tension in this country right now, there is a look always at uh, the need for teachers who are black. Uh, and I would have to say that if we look at educators in gifted education, there is a huge need to encourage educators to uh, be interested in achieving within the field with gifted education. So encouraging people, uh, educators, is, is a really important thing for us to do. And I think for this advisory council to stay timely, we've got to look at what's going on in the field, what's going on in the country, what's going on in the discussion, and, and what can we do to improve the situation, both for children and for the field of gifted education? So any comments related to my comments? The only thing I would throw in is April, you know, I think as we're going through and, and looking at um, uh, unfortunately replacing Dr. Thompson, I've loved working with Dr. Thompson, but as we're looking at replacing those people, one of the things that we need to be cognizant of is trying to add um, people of color to to this to this body as well, and making sure that um, we've got all of our students um, represented in folks that are not that we're making policy, but um, you know to make sure that their uh, their interests are are represented on our council as well. We will have Dr. Thompson's seat to fill, and we have two that have remained vacant since the last executive order. One of those is a um, um, special education teacher and the other is a speech pathologist. So if you know of anybody um, and Dr. Thompson's position was a post-secondary ed. So if you know anybody in those categories who may be interested in applying to be part of the committee, um, let me know and you, I can give you the the application that they fill out that gets goes to the governor's office. And the cabinet. April, yes. I would just add to that, that KDE, um, when we coordinate with the governor's office, we do, we have made requests in the past that we would like to have minority representation on all of our boards and commissions. And so that's something we will continue to encourage. And my comment does not relate to that but when people are appointed, they need to be interested in gifted ed, so they come. And it is very possible to fill one of those requirements, but if you're not interested, any time there's a meeting, each of us has at least three or four things we could do that day. And if you're going to make the choice to come to the advisory council, you've got to be interested in gifted ed. Any other comments? Dr. Roberts, I was thinking of a good idea um, to pass along to you. I know that Lisa Hutchison is at Western Kentucky University also. She is our chair of the State Advisory Council for Exceptional Children. So I think it might be good for you and Lisa to have a conversation about, you know, goals for for the councils and, and, and how your work interrelates. But I, I just happened to think about that while I heard you providing some feedback. Do you know Lisa? I don't, but I will. Yeah, so I think it would be a nice conversation for, for you to talk with her about some of your ideas so you can make sure and, uh, you know, try to align on council work. I love your suggestion. Thank you, Joe. Well, that goes down through my list of issues. Do you all have other issues you would like to bring forward? Certainly is a time of uncertainty, isn't it? Well, Mr. Brown, would you like to um, make some comments? Sure, thank you. This has been a great meeting. Um, just want to remind everyone that uh, we do also use the meeting chat feature that is archived. It doesn't just go away when the meeting ends. And so 
when we are collecting um, and memorializing the minutes and the feedback that then goes into the leadership team uh, and to others at KDE, we look at the chat because you all have some great information in there um, as well. Um, there's a, I'm just looking right now. There's a great comment from Lynette. So uh, just know that that is a uh, looked at it, it just in equally as if you uh, spoke uh, verbally. And then uh, April and Joe, are we going to do an exit slip with this group as well? Um, I can send that to them through um, email. Exit yeah, slip. We'll, interesting. We'll, yeah, we'll send you an exit slip. We started doing this with our student advisory. And it works really well. Sometimes when you get off the uh, these virtual meetings, you and, and this goes for in person meetings as well. When you're driving home, you think, well, I wish I would have said this or uh, I needed to make this comment. The exit slips your opportunity to do that or there. Sometimes there are comments you may have that you need us to look at that you just are not comfortable saying in front of the group. That's OK, too. It, the exit slip is very simple. It will take you just a few minutes to fill out. We also look at those to make sure we are including that in our feedback and um, and that's being looped back around to our leadership team. So again, that's not something that just sits over and is never looked at again. So please fill those out for us. It, it gives us valuable information also on how we can improve these uh, advisory meetings. So thank you for that. And then I'll just end by saying I know there's a lot of anxiety about the uh, back to school guidance. Um, we hope to have uh, it just to give you a summary of where we are. The department has issued or will issue up to about a dozen guidance documents on various subjects. You heard about one of them today. Um, we've issued, I believe, around five or six to date. And then the flagship guidance document that I'm calling it because it will probably quickly become the flagship and most referenced guidance document is the one that's primarily authored by the Department for Public Health. They are in the process of refining that document. Uh, we've heard a lot of feedback from superintendents about uh, formats of similar documents in other states. So we've been working uh, hand in hand with the Department of Public Health, the governor's office, the lieutenant governor's office. That guidance should be coming out from public health uh, about, and, and these are the things you're hearing about that you're probably most anxious about, about masking, about uh, being a social, uh, having social distancing at school, um, you know, how's the cafeteria going to work? How's busing going to work? All of those things, uh, all of the guidance is in that main document. And then, of course, the, the other KDE guidance documents will be sub, uh, supplemented with the information from public health. So um, we're about a week behind some other states that are have issued that, that similar document. We want to make sure we get it right. Uh, we, but we also know that's causing a lot of anxiety out there. Uh, we had a great um, education continuation task force meeting yesterday with conversations with public health as well, as well as the lieutenant governor. You may have seen the governor's press conference last night where the lieutenant governor spoke on the issue. Um, and then to at today's superintendent webcast, uh, we'll be fleshing it out a little bit more. So just stay tuned. That's on its way. Um, it is going to be a difficult year. Um, it's going to require uh, school leaders and staff to uh, do some heavy lifting. Uh, Department of Public Health, uh, they have been very good about listening to our concerns about what is practical and what is not practical in schools. And they have really gone an extra mile to meet us where we think we need to be. And so I'm asking everyone uh, in the school family to we need to meet public health where they need us to be, which is to model uh, appropriate uh, actions. And because as we're seeing, there's some, you know, we're all kind of getting antsy and we're getting a little bit lax from not wearing masks and we're seeing what's going on in some other states. And so uh, we've got to continue to do this until we have a vaccine or and or a treatment. So uh, just want to continue. I know you all are, are believers and are doing that, but we just need to make sure when we're talking to our colleagues and our friends and neighbors that we are um, uh, sending that message. So again, thank you all for what you're doing. As I said earlier, this is uh, a 
special place for me because it uh, uh, GT education made me who I am. I still call upon uh, a lot of those leadership uh, lessons and uh, the education that I gained. So thank you for what you do. And uh, again, you're on the advisory council, not just for this meeting, but as things come up, uh, feel free to reach out to me, to Greta, to April, uh, to Joe, any of us as you uh, see things happening or you see things that aren't happening that you think should happen. Uh, everyone have a great rest of the week. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown, for being here. It says we're important that you spent the morning with us. Thank you. And I thank everyone who was here. Julia, can I add a quick note? This is Taylor. Yes. Uh, uh, again, thanks everyone for working with me and, and listening to my diatribes and such as that. And Julia, I appreciate your leadership. Uh, one, uh, a colleague and I at Georgetown are going to uh, propose a presentation, a virtual presentation for the Kentucky Association of Teacher Ed on using uh, technology and maybe some other things to serve gifted students uh, during a pandemic kind of situation, which did not occur very well, apparently, uh, I get from sources. So uh, just to let you know, and I'll be glad to send that to anyone who would like to see a copy of it if it gets accepted. I think so, that would be great. Thank you so much, Taylor, and uh, I look forward to seeing you other places. Thank you, over and out. April, what else shall we say to the group? Um, a quick reminder that the next meeting date is <clears throat> sorry i have a little frog in my throat the next meeting date is august the 27th it should already be on your calendar um at this point i'm going to assume that it will be a virtual meeting because we haven't been given the go ahead for face-to-face -face meetings but if that should change then we can certainly discuss that um i, I don't have anything else on my agenda dr roberts anything from your end I think I'm fine. Um, anyone have closing comments? Dr. Roberts, will you reach out to Joe and I on our project? I will indeed, and I will, okay. I'll do that very soon. I can get with Dr. Roberts and see a couple of times when her schedule is free and then figure out what matches best with, with you guys, if that's acceptable. Great, thank you. And isn't it funny how a schedule that's had lots of things to do is pretty flexible these days um, as we operate from home. I will tell you that we're doing program, the Center for Gifted Studies is doing programming for middle school students right now and online, and it's gone better than I could have ever hoped. We'll be doing programming the first two weeks of July for elementary children, and I think it will be very engaging. And with virtual, you can live any place and participate in it. So I'll, I'll send some information out to you so that you know of that opportunity to share. Great. And Dr. Dr. Roberts, I just wanted to remind everyone, um, Kevin mentioned the exit slip where you can provide additional feedback that you may not have voiced today, and that's very important for us to collect. The link is located in the chat box, and I will also make sure and email that out to everyone. So um, we, we really appreciate everyone um, being in, involved in this meeting today, and we do take your feedback very, it's critically important for us to, um, to hear your voice in this. And Joe, thanks for helping set this up and, and getting it going. I've done lots of Zoom meetings. This is my first one using this particular platform. Work well, you, you, you're just like a pro in here, Dr. Roberts. So oh, you did sure. a good job today. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Stay safe, stay well, and I'll look forward to seeing you in August. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.